Hey folks, my name is Nathan Johnston and welcome to lecture 23 of Introductory Linear Algebra. In today's class, we're going to introduce something called the inverse of a matrix, okay? And the idea here is, well, think about real numbers for a second, okay? With real number multiplication, you have an operation that undoes that multiplication, right? You have division, okay? So one way of thinking about this is if I give you any number a, you can construct another number such that when you multiply them together, you get the number one, okay? There's this number one divided by a that has this magical property. If you multiply these together, you get the number one, okay? And that works as long as your number a, of course, is not zero. If it's zero, there's no hope of doing this, okay? You can't divide by zero. You can't sort of undo multiplication by zero, okay? Well, with matrices, you can do something very, very analogous, okay? You can ask the question, hey, when is there some other matrix out there such that when I multiply them together, I get the matrix version of the number one, I get the identity matrix. In other words, when can I find some other matrix out there such that when I multiply them together, they sort of undo the effect of each other, okay? Like A does something to vectors. When can I find some other matrix that when I multiply them together, it undoes what A did, well, that's going to be the inverse of a matrix. Okay, so definition time. Okay, the inverse of a matrix. What it is, well, first off, your matrix has to be square. Okay, then the inverse of the matrix A, we're going to denote it like this. We're going to call it A to the power of minus 1. Okay, that means the inverse matrix. Okay, well, it's going to be a matrix with the same size, also square of the same size. And it's going to have this property here. It's going to have the property that if you multiply it on the left or on the right, you get the identity matrix, okay? So they undo each other. A and A inverse undo each other, no matter which way you multiply them together, okay? And if such a matrix A inverse exists, then we say that A is invertible. And we're going to see that not every matrix is invertible. You can't always undo the action of A, but when you can, um, we call it invertible, okay? Now, just to sort of get some technicalities out of the way, we've been saying things like the inverse of a matrix, and there's a reason, reason for that, and that reason is inverses, if they exist, they're unique, okay? So every matrix has either no inverse at all, or it has exactly one inverse. You're never going to find a matrix that has two or more inverses, okay? And we can prove this really quickly, okay? So just suppose that a matrix had two inverses, call them B and C, okay? So A, uh, B is an inverse of A, and C is also an inverse of A. Well, then we're going to show that B and C must actually be the same thing. And the way that we're going to prove that is, well, consider this triple matrix product here. Consider the product BAC. I'm just going to compute that product in a couple different ways. The first way that I'm going to compute it is I'm going to group these second two matrices together. I'm going to think of this as B times AC. Okay, so I'm just going to throw in some parentheses. Okay, well, A times C, what is that? Well, C is an inverse of A. So I just scroll back up to my definition. Ah, well, if two matrices are inverses of each other, then when I multiply them together, I'd better get the identity matrix. That's what the definition is. Okay, so A times C is the identity matrix. So this is B times the identity matrix, which of course is just B. Multiplying by the identity matrix does nothing. Okay, so this triple product equals B. But also, if I group things in a different way, okay, so if I take the exact same product, but this time group B and A together, then again, remember B is an inverse of A, Okay, so what that means is that B times A has to be the identity matrix. Okay, so this is identity times C as well, which of course is just C. Multiplying by the identity does nothing. Okay, but that, now you just trace these equalities through, okay? C is equal to this, which is equal to this, which is equal to this, which is... Oh, C is equal to B. Okay, so these two inverses that we found, well, they're actually equal to each other. Okay, so really there is only one inverse. You're never going to get two or more inverses because you could run through this sort of argument here and see that, oh, all of those inverses, well, they're actually the same matrix. Okay, so inverses, if they exist, are unique. Okay, well, how could we verify that two matrices are inverses of each other? Well, you just go back to the definition, okay? So if I give you two matrices and ask you, are these inverses of each other? Well, just check if this property holds. Multiply them together in both ways and check if you get the identity matrix no matter which way you multiply them together. Okay, so let's do a quick example here. Let's show that the inverse of this matrix over here, 2, 5, 1, 3, is 3 minus 5 minus 1, 2. All right. So for now, just verifying inverses. We'll talk about how to actually find inverses later, okay? Uh, maybe in the next lecture or the one after that, but for now, just verifying inverses. So let's show that these are inverses of each other. Okay, so all you do is you multiply them together. So I'm gonna start off, I'm gonna do this matrix times this matrix, and my hope here is that I get the identity matrix, okay? So you just do rows dotted with columns, uh, and I mean, 
Like the calculation is what it is. We've multiplied matrices together for weeks now, so I'm just gonna sort of gloss over this. You do get the identity matrix, okay, when you do that calculation there. And we also have to check when you multiply the other way around, okay? So here I multiplied in one order, but now I'm gonna swap the order of the matrices and multiply in that order as well. I've also gotta get the identity matrix here. And boom, boom, you do get the identity matrix here as well, okay? So you get the identity matrix no matter which order you multiply in. Okay, so good. They really are inverses of each other. That's what that tells us, okay? So they undo the effect of each other, basically. Okay, if you think about them as linear transformations acting on vectors, then, you know, whatever one of the matrices does to vectors, the other matrix undoes to those vectors. It brings them back to where they started. All right, so yeah, like I said, we'll talk about how to actually find the inverse of a matrix if it's not given to us ahead of time. We'll talk about how to find it, you know, in a little bit, in a lecture or two. But for now, let's just look at basic properties of matrix inverses, okay? So let's start with that. Okay, so basic properties of matrix inverses. So first off, the inverse of a matrix, if the inverse of a matrix exists, then the inverse of that inverse is the original matrix itself. So what this is sort of saying is that inverse inverses sort of come in pairs. The inverse of A is A inverse, and then the inverse of this guy over here is A, okay? They're inverses of each other, okay? You never get like a chain of inverses. Oh, the inverse of A is this guy, and then the inverse of this guy is this one over here, and then the inverse of this one is this one over here. That doesn't happen. They're always just in pairs. Inverse of this is this, inverse of this is this. That's what property A here is saying. Okay, property B is very, very, very intuitive. If you remember that sort of matrix inverses, the idea here is we're sort of generalizing number inverses. We're, inver we're generalizing like division of real numbers. The inverse of C times A, where C is a scalar, well, that's just one over C times the inverse of A. Okay, hopefully seems believable enough because the inverse of C is just one over C. The inverse of a transpose, well, that's just the transpose of an inverse, okay? I don't have great intuition for this, but certainly it seems like a nice property. And, so, and I mean, it's straightforward to, to prove this, okay? We're not gonna prove it. We're gonna prove property D here, actually, because property D is kind of the weirder one, okay? Property D says, hey, if you've got, construct a matrix product and you know that those two things in the product are both invertible, okay? So you know A is invertible and B is invertible, then what property D is saying is then, hey, the product is also invertible. A, B is also invertible. And furthermore, the inverse, the inverse of the product is just the product of the inverses, except with the caveat that you have to swap the order of multiplication. Okay, and we've seen something like this earlier in this course. We saw something very analogous to this with the transpose, right? When we had A, B transpose, that was B transpose, A transpose. Similar things happening here. The inverse, when you invert a product, the order of multiplication swaps, okay? Be careful about that. It's not equal to A inverse times B inverse, okay? All right, so let's prove this last property, okay? Let's prove that AB is invertible and this is its inverse, okay? And fortunately, this is actually really straightforward. If you wanna show that, hey, this is the inverse of this, all you gotta do is you multiply them together, right? Just like we did in the example up above when we wanted to show that a certain matrix was the inverse of some other matrix, just multiply them, okay? So same thing we're gonna do here, okay? So we wanna convince ourselves that this B inverse A inverse is the inverse of AB, so just multiply them together. I'm doing AB times the proposed inverse. I've gotta show that that is the identity matrix. Okay, so all I'm gonna do, the way I'm gonna show this, is I'm just gonna regroup parentheses, okay? I'm gonna focus on the Bs in the middle first. Okay, well, B times B inverse, I know that's the identity matrix, okay? I'm told B is invertible, here's its inverse, multiply them together, you get the identity. Okay, so that's A times identity times A inverse. And then again, as always, multiplying by the identity does nothing. So, okay, so just forget about that identity in the middle. You're just left with A times A inverse. And then, oh, yay, hey, that, that, that's a matrix times its inverse again. Okay, so that's just identity. Great. So, yeah, this times this is the identity. So, they're inverses of each other. Ooh, hold on. Mm, careful. Remember, you got to multiply them in both orders, right? Definition of the inverse is, you know, A times A inverse is the identity, but also A inverse times A is the identity, okay? So you gotta check both ways. So multiply these two matrices together in the other order as well, and again, you want this to be the identity. Fortunately, the approach that you can use to show that this is the identity is the exact same. Just regroup parentheses, focus on the matrices in the middle first, okay? So we're left with an A inverse times A in the middle here, which is the identity, right? A matrix times this inverse is the identity. And that just simplifies down to B inverse B because the identity goes away, and then that's the identity as well. All right, great. So we just leached off of the inverses of A and B to get the inverse of A times B.
All right, so yeah, our conclusion from there is that yes, AB is invertible because, hey, we found an inverse of it. Okay, and the, the other three properties can be proved in a very similar manner, okay? If you wanna show that, for example, uh, uh, the inverse of a transpose is the transpose of the inverse, well, just multiply this matrix together with a transpose, okay? And see that you get the identity matrix, okay? And that'll mean that, yeah, this really is the inverse of the transpose. Okay, and similarly for properties A and B, it can be, they can be all be proved in a very similar manner to each other. Okay, and this property D, this fact that the inverse of a product is a product of the inverses, but in the opposite order, for transposes, this was not intuitive, okay? We didn't have a nice sort of reason for this, but for inverses, we do have a nice reason for this. Remember, we think of matrices as doing things, okay? Doing things to vectors in particular. They're functions that act on vectors, okay? But when you wanna undo doing things, you have to undo them in the opposite order, okay? And sort of the standard way of phrasing this is something like this. Um, like when you, in the morning, you put on your socks and then you put on your shoes, but then at nighttime, you take off your shoes and then you take off your socks. You undo your morning operation in the opposite order, right? Shoes and then socks. Sorry, socks and then shoes, but then shoes and then socks when you're taking them off, right? They go on in the opposite order that they come off, okay? Because those operations are inverses of each other. The inverse operation of dressing your feet, you know, you have to sort of un you undo the two components of that in the opposite order, okay? And really that's what's happening here. And like you have two things that you're doing and to undo those two things, you have to undo them individually, but in the opposite order. Okay. Now, I mentioned that not every matrix is invertible, okay? For example, I mean, even in the one by one case, the zero matrix is not invertible, and more generally, the zero matrix is ne never invertible, right? Because we thought, saw this theorem that said, hey, if you take the zero matrix and you multiply it by anything, you're gonna get the zero matrix. Okay, so certainly you're never gonna be able to find a matrix A such that zero times A is the identity matrix, okay? That's what you need for zero to be invertible, right? You need zero times something is the identity. Never gonna happen, because zero times anything is always zero. All right, so zero matrix is never invertible. And in the one by one case, this is just the usual fact that the number zero is not invertible. You can't divide by zero. So that's all that's happening there, okay? But for matrices, it's a little bit worse than this, okay? There are things other than the zero matrix that are also not invertible. Okay, and we've seen a couple examples of these. So let's just remind ourselves of what they are. Okay, for example, I guess the first example of this that we saw was a projection matrix, okay? So remember, if you have a unit vector u that's pointing you know, in the direction of some line, then the matrix u times u transpose, where here we're thinking of u as a column vector, so this is column vector times row vector, then that's a matrix and it's a projection matrix. It projects Rn onto the line in the direction of that unit vector u. So if I draw a little picture here in two dimensional space, here's what's happening. Here's some line that I'm gonna project onto, and then here's a unit vector on that line, okay? And then there's some vector V, and when I multiply that vector V by A, it just squishes it down onto that line at a right angle, okay? It sort of casts its shadow down onto that line. So AV is this vector here, that's sort of the shadow of V itself. It's the projection of V. All right. Now I claim that there are two different vectors that could get projected onto the same spot. Actually, there are infinitely many vectors that get projected onto the same spot, but all we need is two, all right? So I claim that there's some other vector W that also has its shadow on the same spot, okay? And hopefully that's intuitive enough. You just need any other vector that's sort of like this right angle piece over here is the same. So any other vector that's pointing anywhere on this perpendicular line here. So, I mean, I'll draw a picture like this. This vector W over here, again, it just gets projected down at a right angle to the exact same spot. So even though W and V are different, A times W and A times V are the same. Okay, and I claim that that's a problem for invertibility. And why is that? Well. Remember, like, sort of our intuition for invertibility was it undoes what the original matrix does, okay? If A inverse existed, we would have to be able to undo what A did. Okay, but how can we undo this projection down onto a line? Like, if I'm just given this vector AV here, I have no idea where it came from. It could have come from V, or it could have come from W. So how, how do I have any hope of undoing what A did? There's sort of not enough information there. Maybe a little bit more concretely, like if you want to write down this argument with symbols, if A were invertible, then I could find some matrix A inverse 
And I would multiply this equation AV equals AW on the left by that inverse. And when I did that, then the A inverse A would cancel, the A inverse A would cancel, and I'd just be left with V equals W. But that makes no sense. I was told specifically that V does not equal W, like I found two different vectors V and W such that A times them is the same. Whenever that happens, matrix is not invertible because you could do this sort of thing to show that the two input vectors had to be the same as well. All right, so these projection matrices, and actually lots of other matrices too, they're not invertible. They have no inverse, no matter how hard you look for one. All right, so let's think a little bit now about how can we determine whether or not a matrix is invertible, okay? And getting a little bit towards actually finding an inverse as well. How can we determine if a matrix is invertible? Well, think back to elementary matrices a little bit, okay? If we were able to row reduce this augmented matrix that we saw last class, this A augmented with an identity matrix, if we could row reduce that all the way down to I augmented with something, just whatever junk is left over on the right-hand side, the important piece is that we've row reduced it down to something with an identity on the left, then the theorem from last class tells us that what that means is that E times A equals the identity matrix, right? In general, the statement is that E times A equals the reduced row echelon form here, or whatever you get here. Okay, but if we were able to get an identity matrix there, if we could get all the way down to a reduced row echelon form of an identity matrix here, then the special case we would have is E times A equals I. Okay, and that seems a little bit suggestive, right? Here we've got a product of two matrices that's the identity matrix. Does that mean that E is the inverse of A? I mean, not right away, because remember, I mean, for inverses, you need to be able to multiply them in either order and get the identity matrix, but certainly it seems suggestive of that, right? All right, so that's sort of the idea here. If we were able to row reduce A down to the identity matrix, it seems kind of like maybe it should be invertible. And that's gonna be true, we're gonna prove that. Well, we're gonna prove pieces of that. Okay, so here's big beast of a theorem time that tells us exactly when matrices are invertible. It turns out that a matrix being invertible is equivalent to a whole bunch of other really nice stuff. Okay, so this is our big beast of a theorem that says, hey, matrix being invertible, is equivalent to this and this and this and this and this. So all of these things, they're all the same. If one of them happens, all of them happen. All right, and the first one is, well, A is invertible. Well, A is invertible if and only if its reduced row echelon form is the identity matrix. In other words, if you're able to row reduce it down to the identity matrix, it's invertible. If you're not able to do that, then it's not invertible. All right, and that's equivalent to being able to write A as a product of elementary matrices, okay? So remember last lecture, I said that elementary matrices, in a sense, they're building blocks of most matrices out there. What I meant by that is exactly this fact here. You can write every invertible matrix as a product of elementary matrices. Okay, you can't do this for, for non-invertible matrices, but you can do it for every invertible matrix. And it turns out that most matrices are invertible in sort of a well-defined sense. Okay, so most matrices can be broken up just into a product of elementary matrices. All right, and then these conditions are also all equivalent to a bunch of nice conditions about linear systems. Okay, so if you have a linear system with some coefficient matrix A, then that coefficient matrix is invertible if and only if that linear system has a solution no matter what right-hand side you pick. Okay, and that's equivalent to that linear system has a unique solution no matter what right-hand side you pick. And that's equivalent to that linear system has a unique solution just for the specific special case when the right-hand side is zero. Okay, and this last case here, I mean, maybe it's worth noting that in this case, if this linear system has a unique solution, we actually know right away what that unique solution must be. It must be x equals zero, right? Because that's always the solution of a linear system that has zero on the right-hand side. I could always choose x equals zero. So this linear system, there are only two possibilities. Either it has a unique solution, which is x equals zero, and in that case, a is invertible, okay? Or it has infinitely many solutions, in which case a is not invertible. All right, so we're gonna prove bits and pieces of this theorem, but for now, let's just do a quick example of determining whether or not matrices are invertible. Okay, so let's start off with this one here. One, two, two, four. Let's determine whether or not this matrix is invertible. Okay, and for practical purposes, determining whether or not a matrix is invertible, you're gonna to wanna to use property B here, okay? You're gonna to wanna to compute the reduced row echelon form of A, and then just check, hey, is that the identity matrix? Yes or no determines whether or not it's invertible. 
Okay, so start off with this matrix here. We're gonna do row operations, get it down to reduce row echelon form. And this matrix is really simple. We only had to do one row operation to get it down into reduce row echelon form. And now you just look at this reduce row echelon form and you say, is that the identity matrix? And you squint really hard. And no, it's not the identity matrix, right? Okay, so that matrix that we started with must not be invertible because this reduce row echelon form is not the identity matrix. All right, let's do another one. Let's let's look at a different matrix. Let's look at the matrix one, three, four, seven. And again, the question is, is that invertible or not? Well, do your row operations, do your Gauss Jordan elimination, do all the usual stuff that you we've liked doing for the last week and a bit. Okay, so we want to start off by getting a zero down here. So we're going to do this row operation that gets a zero down there and then turn this minus five into a one. So we do a scalar multiplication row operation and then get rid of the three up there. So do another addition row operation. And hey, we row reduced it all the way to the identity matrix. So great. That matrix is invertible because this, this is the reduced row echelon form of the original matrix that we started with. All right, so that's how you check if a matrix is invertible. Next class, we'll talk about how to actually find the inverse of a matrix. But for now, I want to convince you of at least a few pieces of this theorem, okay? I mean, the full proof of this theorem is in the textbook if you want to have a look at that. But for now, let's just prove some bits and pieces of it just to convince ourselves that enough of it is true to get some intuition for it. Okay, so the first thing that I'm gonna to try to convince you of is the fact that C implies A, okay? I'm gonna to try to convince you that if you can multiply, if you can write your matrix as a product of invertible matrices, sorry, if you can write your matrix as a product of elementary matrices, then your matrix must be invertible, okay? That's what I'm gonna to try to convince you of right now. Okay, and the way that I'm gonna convince you of this is first off, I'm gonna show that every elementary matrix is invertible, okay? And the reason for this is, well, you can undo elementary row operations. Every one of those elementary row operations, you can undo it just by doing another elementary row operation of the same type. Okay, so for example, the addition row operation, row i plus c times row j, you can undo that row operation just by doing row i minus c row j. You're just gonna add c row j and then subtract c row j from row i. Okay, so they undo each other. They, they get you back where you started. Similarly, the multiplication row operation, C times rho J, well, you can just do one over C times rho J, okay? And if you look back to week five's notes, in this, in the definition of this row operation here, the C times rho J, we, we made it, we, we said that C had to be non-zero for this to be a valid elementary row operation. And this is kind of why we need these elementary row operations to be invertible or undoable, okay? If C was zero, then you wouldn't be able to undo that elementary row operation, which creates all sorts of problems. Okay, so you can always undo it via this because C is not zero. Okay, and then the last elementary row operation was just swapping two rows. And the way you can undo swapping two rows is you just swap them again. So you do the same elementary row operation again. Okay, so in terms of elementary matrices, what this means is that you can invert each of the elementary matrices. So for example, if you have an elementary matrix corresponding to an addition row operation like this, this is like, this is uh, row two plus three, row two plus three row one, you know, the inverse of that is gonna be the elementary matrix corresponding to row two minus three row one, okay? It's just the elementary uh, row operation that undoes the original one. Okay, and similarly for the sort of the diagonal scaling uh, elementary matrix, well, the way that you undo it is you just take the inverse. You just do one divided by whatever the C is on the diagonal, okay? So leave all the ones alone, all the zeros alone, and four becomes one over four, okay? This corresponds to the elementary row operation four times row two, and this one corresponds to one quarter times row two. They undo each other, okay? And similarly for swap, uh, the swap row operation, okay? This matrix here, it swaps rows one and two. The inverse of it is just itself, right? Swap row operations are undone by themselves. So it's undone by just swapping row one and two again, okay? So elementary matrices, they're always invertible, okay? Well, I mean, if your matrix A is written as a product of elementary matrices, then every one of these guys over here is invertible. And a product of invertible matrices is again invertible, right? This is one of the properties. This is basically property D from this theorem that we saw way back here. Okay, if I scroll back up a couple pages, property B, sorry, property D said, hey, if you take two matrices A and B that are invertible and you multiply them together, you get something that's still invertible. Okay, and the same exact thing works no matter how many invertible matrices you multiply together. So here we're multiplying K invertible matrices together. Ah their product must still be invertible, okay? So that's why if your matrix can be written as a product of elementary matrices, 
it's invertible. That's why C implies A in this theorem. All right, and I also wanna talk a little bit about this connection between invertibility and linear systems. So I wanna talk a little bit about why A implies things like D, E, and F, okay? Why, why those linear systems have unique solutions, okay? So, well, the idea here is consider this linear system AX equals B. If A is invertible, then we can multiply on the left by A inverse, right? Okay, and when we do that, what's gonna happen is this A inverse A here, those cancel out. Okay, they just turn into an identity matrix. So then on the left, all we're gonna be left with is X. Okay, so if AX equals B, then you multiply on the left by A inverse, and you're gonna see that X equals A inverse B. Okay, and that tells us right away that invertibility implies this linear system always has a unique solution because we were able to find what that solution was, right? This is, if AX equals B, then X must equal A inverse times B, okay? There's only that one possibility. So in other words, this linear system AX equals B has a unique solution no matter what B is. And this is what it is. We can even come up with this explicit formula for what that unique solution is. Okay, so property A, it implies property E right away, okay? If your matrix is invertible, then AX equals B has a unique solution, no matter what that right-hand side B is. Okay, and property E, I mean, it sort of trivially implies D and F, right? If it has a unique solution for all B, then it has a unique solution when B is zero. If it has a unique solution for all B, then it has a solution for all B as well, okay? There are a bunch of other implications there that we didn't prove, but that's maybe enough to hopefully give you some intuition for why something like this should be true. If you wanna see the proofs of the other implications, they're all in the textbook, but that's maybe enough for now. Today's been sort of a long lecture. So maybe I'll just leave it there. Have a good one, folks. I will see you next class when we will talk about how to actually find the inverse of a matrix when it exists.